Gosain from the Power Project Office uh, at Northeastern University. Uh, we are here to uh, follow on from the keynote that you heard earlier by uh, Dr. Thyaganand Gopal from the National Science Foundation to not only give opportunity to the first two platforms that have been awarded as part of this program, but also to brainstorm and share with you our thoughts on what's going to happen next uh, for uh, the, the other two remaining platforms that the Power Project Office has been tasked with uh, awarding. So just a quick uh, overview of what we're going to do. Um, we want to start with the um, uh, Power Information Day, uh, which is essentially a summary of what, uh, how far we've come and where we are headed to next. And we want to give you some pointers if you are people in the room that are thinking of applying for uh, the next round of uh, Power Platform RFP, which, will, uh, which is anticipated in uh, Q3 of this year. Um, we want to give you some pointers and guidance to how you should be absorbing the information that the awardees are going to share with you and what are sort of the things that you should be thinking about as you're beginning to prepare um, for uh, submitting your responses uh, to the RFP as well as to the RFI, which was also advertised earlier in the keynote session. Um, and then we'll hear from our power bodies, both from uh, the Cosmos platform at New York City and the Powder Renew platform at Salt Lake City. And then we'll open the floor up for uh, Q&A with the representatives from the Power Project Office as well as NSF. So you, you heard earlier today, if you weren't uh, here for the keynote session, I'll just give you a quick recap. Um, over the past year, the Power Project Office, um, under the guidance of the National Science Foundation and the industry consortium that we formed of 28 companies, um, spent a year in uh, running a public round uh, request for proposals uh, phase, which culminated with awards to two platforms, one uh, called Powder Renew, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I still haven't memorized what these acronyms stand for, so that's on me, but I'll share that with you shortly. Um, and Salt Lake City, as well as Cosmos platform at uh, New York City. And what we want to share with you at this stage is there are two remaining platforms that still need to be awarded, and that, that process um, has begun already. And what we've done to begin that process is uh, coinciding with when the official announcements were made for these platforms on April 9th, we issued an RFI. The link for that uh, is here. It's also on our website at advancedwireless.org. And the RFI was essentially issued uh, to get a sense of uh, which uh, you'll hear about the technical areas, but the um, the overwhelming feedback that we were receiving after the first awards were made was to focus the remaining two platforms somewhat on applications, use cases, or industry verticals, and use those requirements, use the technical requirements from each of those industries to drive what those platforms will enable or what they will build. Um, the, uh, one of the things that we sort of uh, said in the RFI was to stay clear of round one platform areas. This is meant solely from the purposes of developing the technology, not necessarily using the technology. So if you are thinking about, for example, um, using ultra-reliable uh, low-latency applications or high-capacity uh, low-latency applications, you might as well think about millimeter wave networks or mice of MIMO networks, which are sort of the key areas that they're using. But you can use, uh, think of these uh, technologies as uh, being uh, available for use on your platforms, not necessarily the research behind uh, these uh, physical layer RF uh, technologies or new waveforms per se. Um, we also are soliciting feedback. If you were one of the teams that uh, participated in our round one um, our RFP, we want to hear from you with respect to what worked for you, what didn't work, what sort of information was uh, missing. And we collected some of this feedback um, uh, at the end of the first round. And we've, um, we've absorbed some of it, and you'll see that reflected when the new RFP is issued. Uh, but we really want to get that input uh, from you. And these are sort of very, uh, there's no set format. The goal here is that these are two page um, uh, requirements. We don't need long essays, essentially concise things that are to the point. Um, if you could uh, sort of 
give us the pulse. You, you guys in this room are the people who are going to build these platforms. So if you have the finger on the pulse of what sort of use cases and applications are being thought of in the community, given the time frame that you're looking at, which is around 2020 and onwards, you need to give us that input that we can absorb that and then reflect that back in the RFP that we're going to develop. So these aren't ideas that we dream up. These are evidence-based uh, ideas that will be uh, asked for in the RFP. So we sort of are using this RFP phase to collect and gather that information. A couple more things around this. So we really want you to push the envelope. Um, this is uh, not just um, about you know, a proof of concept, given that these uh, platforms are going to be funded for five years and there is a sustainability plan or requirement for sustainability for these platforms here. So the goal is to focus on what's new and what's cutting edge. And one of the things that I would caution at this stage, given what we are hearing, is that we would urge you to begin to uh, think about the use cases and application areas that you are uh, thinking of submitting as part of your RFI responses and also start to think or talk to partners, uh, people who are experts in these industry vertical areas. We don't expect folks in this room who are working on low layer technologies, either networks, communications, theory, uh, to have uh, a good guess of what are the requirements for um, an unmanned aerial vehicle system or an industrial IoT uh, platform or a connected vehicle uh, system. So you need to engage with those partners and that would be something that we are hoping to leverage uh, from uh, from the members in this audience, as well as uh, the live stream that we have going on. And thank you to IEEE for uh, keeping that up for us. Um, one of the things we also want to hear from you is about relevant trade-offs and uh, some of the implications around them. Uh, this would, again, give us a better gauge of what sort of investment is needed and what sort of resources need to be committed and what are the challenges or what are the pitfalls of looking at one area versus another. Given that we only have two platforms, we can't cover everything under the sun, but we need to be able to prioritize what we ask for in the RFP, and that would be something that we uh, judge based on uh, the request, uh, the RFI responses that we receive. And we're looking for various possible solutions to lots and lots of challenges, so please feel free to submit to that. Um, with that, just want to uh, let you know the, the round two RFP will be, uh, again, a community-driven effort. We, the PPO, is essentially a shepherd of gathering this information, processing it, and reflecting it back to the community. Uh, we're soliciting this from not only our research community partners, but also our industry partners, as well as people who already did this um, in the round one phase. And the goal is to absorb these responses and issue the uh, next RFP uh, by in uh, Q3 2018 with an anticipated award date of uh, fall 2019. Um, so with that, again, I just want to you know, uh, acknowledge uh, the first two platform awardees, uh, Powder and Cosmos. And I want to highlight that as you listen to their presentations, um, listen to what sort of, uh, excuse me, uh, what sort of technical areas that they're going to be focusing on, what they're going to be building as they ramp up in developing and deploying these um, uh, pa uh, platforms that they're going to talk about. So very high level, obviously you'll hear uh, straight from the horse's mouth, you'll get these uh, presentations shortly. But um, for the Cosmos platform, the focus is on optical networking, millimeter wave networks, 28 and 60 gigahertz, and sub-6 gigahertz programmable networks with a large edge and core cloud uh, compute fabric um, so to give you a layered architecture. And for the Powder Renew platform, you have sub-6 uh, gigahertz with programmable massive MIMO. As you heard from uh, Thiaga about uh, building massive MIMO base stations with 256 antenna elements, um, doing low latency, high capacity front haul, back haul networks, as well as flexible base station density, uh, mobility capabilities, and also drop your drop in equipment and bring your own uh, device capabilities. Uh, these slides will be posted on our website. Um, don't want to take too much more of your time. We'll take questions about the RFI and the RFP process after the presentations have been made. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. With that, I'd like to introduce, uh, first of all, the Cosmos uh, platform. And uh, Ivan Saskar, if I may uh, have you come up. Uh, Ivan Saskar is the Associate Director and uh, Project Director at WinLab and also Project Director for the Cosmos Project. He's responsible for experimental systems and prototyping projects. He's been co-PI and Project Manager for all three phases of the NSF orbit testbed and is also co-chair of the IEEE 5G and Beyond initiative for the testbed working group. Uh, so uh, welcome, Ivan. So, so first of all, the, the Cosmos Project, um, the participants are uh, Rutgers University, Columbia, and NYU. 
and in partnership with, uh, of course, New York City, Silicon Harlem, City College, and University of Arizona. So the, the cast of characters, these are the uh, people who are involved in the project. As you can see, it's a fairly large group of people covering these uh, six inst seven institutions. Um, and so I, I actually have way too many slides for 20 minutes talk, so, so I'll, I'll probably skip a few. But the uh, main idea of the Cosmos project vision is really to look at low latency, uh, high bandwidth applications, which require a lot of edge computing, right? And so um, the assumption is that we want to reduce the latency to sub five milliseconds. Um, people are talking about one millisecond. I'm not sure how realistic that is. End-to-end uh, -end latency, by the way. But most, more importantly, uh, to sort of support the edge cloud applications um, with a massive computing setting behind the uh, radio access network. Now, the um, types of applications we're talking about, of course, is focused on uh, somewhat on machine-to-machine -machine communication in addition to AR and VR. Um, main reason for focusing on, on those applications like connected car are because those are the ones that really require low la latency. It's hard to imagine that humans can see anything below 20 milliseconds in terms of latency. However, machines can certainly benefit from it. And of course, industrial control uh, is something that's interesting um, in the city context as well. <clears throat> now, um, I, I guess I don't have to explain why New York City is an interesting playground for, for testing wireless technology, because pro it's probably the most difficult environment to deploy wireless. Yet at the same time, it has all the attributes of, of sort of very interesting place, right? And so I'm, I'm going to just skip the, the uh, justification, but rather to sort of talk about the planned deployment. We are talking about West Harlem area. That's, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with New York City, it's between 120th and 135th Street and between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenues. Um, and it's literally between Columbia University and City College. Uh, each of them is on the, on the two sides of the area. We plan to have nine large sites and about 40 medium sites, and shortly I'll, I'll explain what those are. Uh, the idea is to actually all of these 49 or 50 sites will have massive fiber connectivity. There will be around 200 what we call the small nodes or near portable nodes. Obviously, technology that we are talking about is not yet fully portable. So you can think of it something that person can carry around or more, more likely something that will be deployed in the car. Um, and then, of course, um, there are all sorts of other initiatives in the city that we plan to uh, interact with uh, during the, the run of the Cosmos project. Uh, talking about technology, um, the layering that you see on the picture is really not uh, based on any particular type of uh, uh, OSI layers, but rather uh, tries to depict the, the notion of programmability. At the lower level, you have the SDR-based or fully programmable radio access network. Above that, you have cloud that's also fully programmable, as all clouds are. And then on top of it, you have uh, an application layer that people will play with. Um, everything has to be programmable as much as we could uh, achieve it, right? And, and obviously, there are all sorts of issues with uh, off-the-shelf technology that we cannot control. But, you know, we are trying to deploy mostly components that are fully programmable. Um, as far as system architecture, um, this is somewhat a confusing picture, but as I mentioned, we have three types of nodes, small, medium, large. Large obviously refers to the rooftop deployment where you have all the space and, and the power available. Medium is something that you can think of as a, a pico cells or something that you would deploy on the lampposts or maybe sides of the buildings. And there, of course, we have a, a non-trivial challenge in the volume, uh, meaning that you, there are all sorts of restrictions, and, and I know more about zoning rules <laughs> that I ever wanted to know about, uh, as to what you can put on the lamppost, right, in a sense that there is a volume and power constraint. So some of these nodes will be on the lamppost, some will be on the sides of the buildings, or maybe even on the, on the ground, think like traffic lights uh, deployments. Uh, there is a massive optical backbone, um, which is highly programmable at the physical layer, right? And then, of course, uh, there is a lot of cloud uh, stuff in between. Now, key technologies, software-defined radios. Uh, the focus is on two 
uh, SDRs, sub-6 gigahertz and, and millimeter wave. Uh, target bandwidth for millimeter wave is actually in the order of 500 megahertz. We will see how far we can push that. I mean, that's a non-trivial bandwidth for software-defined radius. Um, uh, a lot of processing is spread throughout the deployment area, meaning that some of it is near the antenna, some of it is on the nearest rooftop, and a lot of it is elsewhere in the, in the uh, footprint. And then, of course, it's all based on, on some of our previous experiences on the, with the software-defined radios, of course, most notably in the orbit testbed. <clears throat> Millimeter wave, um, it's really based on IBM's, uh, and IBM Ericsson cooperation, produced a millimeter wave array uh, that has uh, 64 antennas, actually uh, two polarization and 64 antennas, uh, with about 800 megahertz of baseband bandwidth uh, at 28 gigahertz. Uh, and IBM is full partner in this project, so they will help us with the integration with the software-defined radios. Inter nice thing about the IBM array is that um, it, it can be configured in two modes, either as a single 64 element array, which gives you a very high pencil beam characteristics or as uh, eight uh, simultaneous beams uh, of, of 16 elements, which of course is something that we would like to handle, but that's non-trivial exercise to do eight, eight, eight times 500 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, and of course, NYU is a partner that has extensive experience with millimeter wave development and prototyping. Optical networking, uh, as I said, it's, it's a heavily programmable optical layer and Below, and you can, you can argue it's, a, it's an underlay, optical underlay, which is, which is based on DWDM. Uh, ambition is to be able to recolor light at various locations in the testbed, which will allow you to create, to allow you two things, to create arbitrary topologies of connectivity between the nodes in the testbed, as well as the ability to run arbitrary protocols on top of it, because you're switching optical layer, um, and therefore it don't depend on any particular protocols which is, of course, important if you're trying to do very tight synchronization and stuff using the optical layer. And this is all uh, done um, in cooperation with the University of Arizona and the CN uh, Optical uh, ERC, right? Um, SDN and cloud is all over the place. I mean, it's very uh, uh, sort of standard cloud deployment, except that um, each uh, processing unit consists of both, all three technologies, meaning CPU, GPU, and FPGA. Um, Hopefully, um, and then of course, it's all connected to the rest of the infrastructure, meaning the Genie and, and Cloud Lab instances, so you know, you, people can sort of think about how to split the processing between all these elements. Um, it's actually one of the big research items as to how do you partition any particular service across uh, these platforms. And then of course, uh, the last but not the least is the uh, management technology that we have, and it's, it's based on OMF. Um, which stands for Orbit Management Framework, which is a framework that's used to manage the orbit testbed, and we're just um, trying to expand that. And actually, this is a discussion that we'll hopefully have between the two teams to start to, to sort of harmonize some of the things we have. Now, um, I, I really don't have time to talk about types of experiments that, that people want to do, but these are just, I believe, I only have two examples. The first one is the full duplex stuff, so we already have a fairly a uh, nice ongoing collaboration with Columbia to deploy their uh, full duplex RFICs in the, in the orbit testbed, so we'll try to push that into the uh, Cosmos testbed as well and sort of allow people to play with the full duplex. Uh, and then of one of the more ambitious is the uh, project to do vehicular sharing in, in the city. Um, this is actually one of, of more interesting aspects of the, of the Cosmos deployment. Uh, the fact that New York City has a, a very strong interest in trying to figure out what's happening with intersections and <laughs> traffic in the city. So, so they would like to see how, uh, say, a testbed like this could be used to do something. I, I don't think there is any hope, but, you know, nevertheless, <laughs> right? It would be nice to at least understand that the chaos is, is reaching the breaking point. Okay, so um, quite a lot of um, <clears throat> stuff was already done on, on the deployment and outreach. Um, as I said, the Cosmos is really taking the orbit testbed and putting it in this area, which is, this is actually a beautiful view from the uh, 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 Columbia's data center building. It's, it's, uh, this is the deployment area. What you see here is Broadway on the left-hand side. Um, and this is on 120th Street, so you're literally looking at the deployment area. 
Um, the doesn't move. There you go. It's getting deployed. Yes, it takes time to deploy. <laughs> So, uh, so you can see here the deployment, uh, actually, uh, area, uh, the, the green dot, square dot, uh, square uh, pointer is really where that picture is taken from, that location. Yellow ones are the rooftop locations, and actually this is cropped pictures, so you don't see the other four. Uh, the yellow ones are the Columbia property uh, street level locations in the uh, blue ones are the city college, and the red ones are the city, New York City deployment locations, right? So this just gives you an idea of, of uh, how this will be deployed. Of course, it's, it's going to be done in a couple of phases. Um, and, and first, we'll start with the university grants because that's much easier to work with. Uh, just to illustrate how it really looks in practice, you have a massive optical switch in, in Colombia. Each of the rooftop locations has actually a number of optical switches, lots of rodents connected to them, which allows you to create these crazy topologies as shown in this particular picture where from the cloud uh, center in, at, at 32 avenues of the Americas, which is the largest Harrier hotel in the world, where we, New York, uh, NYU has a, a, a collocation space, we can establish the optical path going through these four locations uh, just because the optical switching allows you to do that and light recoloring. And, you know, you can, of course, think about how do you partition experiments in a similar fashion, uh, giving each of them a separate topology. In addition to consortium co uh, uh, of, of power companies, there is a lot of local uh, support for the project. And when I say support, I mean interest and support. And, of course, big part of the whole thing is the outreach to the, to the city. Uh, that, that I'll have a few slides on shortly. Um, the Silicon Harlem is an is a organization established in Harlem to promote um, technology and innovation inside the Harlem area, and they're, they're one of the main elements of our community outreach. They are organizing a lot of conferences, and, and they will be active participants in the project. Um, as a matter of fact, we already, uh, this year, are doing a fairly ambitious project where we're trying to train 10 teachers in New York uh, schools to participate in, and play with the testbed. Now, of course, it will be a while before the testbed is up, but the assumption is that teachers will also need some time to absorb uh, the massive amount of stuff we're throwing at them, right? So, um, and, and this is, again, a phased approach, and, and we're trying to sort of get to a point where um, we will allow all the city schools to run tests or labs on the, on the testbed. Um, so to summarize, and this is the last slide, really is, focuses on ultra-low latency, high bandwidth, cloud-supported applications. Um, it's, we are trying to make it as open as we can. So in other words, at least initially, all the equipment that we are deploying will be open, based on open source stuff. Um, it's West Harlem, about a square mile, uh, 15 streets, two avenues and a very strong local community outreach. So, um, we would really look, we are looking forward to hear your feedback, what you would like us to, to add to the testbed or remove from it, and, and you know, to tell us what kind of experiments you would like to see us enable in the testbed. So at this, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, and if there are any questions, please. So, so we'll, 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 hold oh, off, uh, okay. yeah, we'll hold off questions there. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Okay, next up, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Kober, uh, Kobus Vandermerv and uh, Professor Rashu Sabarwal uh, while they're coming up. Uh, Kobus Vandermerv is the JL approved professor in School of Computing and director of the Flux Research Group at University of Utah. He joined University of Utah uh, in 2012 after a stint at AT&T Labs Research. He's the PI and director of the Powder uh, Project. And uh, Professor Rashu Sabarwal is a professor of electrical and computer engineering in Rice University, founder of the WARP project, an open source project which is now in use at more than 125 research groups and is being used by 450 research articles. And he was also, um, uh, his group was also honored with the Test of Time Award for those of you who were at ICC here. So congratulations on that and welcome. Thanks. Thanks, my name. Uh, so uh, we have uh, too many slides. Uh, 
as well, so I'll, I'll quickly go through this. So uh, the way we're thinking of our project is that we want to enable fundamental advances in wireless technologies and applications and services, and we think we're going to do that through a number of world firsts. And we've identified four of those. Uh, so the first one is world first in terms of end-to-end -end software defined city scale uh, wireless lab. And then uh, from novice to expert repeatable wireless uh, research environment. And then a uh, fully programmable massive MIMO uh, platform and uh, open access uh, massive MIMO uh, software stacks. So I'll be uh, talking about the, the first two of those, uh, focusing on the, the Powder platform, um, and then Ashu will, uh, will talk about the massive MIMO uh, aspects uh, in, in more detail. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a cartoon picture of what we're uh, planning to do. Um, and just go by the numbers here, so we're gonna be uh, deploying essentially base stations at uh, various locations on campus, uh, rooftop deployments, street-level deployments. Um, that's number one in the picture there. Number two, uh, this will be connected through essentially a, fi a private fiber uh, front hall network uh, to a uh, what we call a local or near-edge compute. And so the, the emphasis here is on really high capacity, really low latency, uh, with um, a variety of compute platforms in that uh, near compute uh, location. So uh, going on from there, uh, of course, fiber backhaul from that edge compute to a uh, downtown data center. This is an existing University of Utah downtown data center where we have a very significant uh, cloud deployment as part of our cloud lab uh, infrastructure. And then the rest of the numbers in the top of the figure is just saying we will be federating with uh, all of our existing systems. So Cloud Lab, for example, is actually de de uh, deployed across uh, three different locations, so we'll federate with that. We will also federate with our existing controlled um, wireless and, and mobile testbed uh, on uh, the uh, University of Utah campus. So that's kind of the, the fixed infrastructure, if you will. And then uh, in order to realize mobility, uh, we have a, a bunch of different uh, deployment plans for uh, mobile endpoints. So we will have fixed endpoints that we just deploy on uh, locations around campus, but uh, perhaps more interestingly, uh, we're also going to deploy um, mobile endpoints on buses or shuttles on the University of Utah campus and on other vehicles uh, on campus and in the uh, Salt Lake City downtown uh, area. We also have uh, portable units, uh, that you can either carry around or put in a vehicle and drive on a very specific route each, if you want to have very specific mobility as part of your uh, experiment. And then finally, uh, we will have uh, programmable sensor units that will also be deployed uh, around uh, the environment. Uh, and they will have uh, on-board capabilities for a number of IoT uh, protocols and then uh, a small software-defined uh, radio component as well. So a key to all of this, because we don't really know what research you all will want to do on this, is to make this uh, test bed flexible. And really the only way we can do that is to make it uh, software defined, having general purpose quote unquote hardware with software that defines the actual functionality of each component in the test bed. And so our approach is to do this on an end-to-end -end basis. So from the sensor units at the bottom of the picture all the way through to the cloud in the back end, um, having that software defined uh, in, in all aspects uh, of it. Um, this uh, high-level view of our deployment strategy, so we will uh, cover these three locations uh, in the Salt Lake City area. On the right-hand side is the University of Utah campus. Um, we uh, we'll have this residential area in between and then extend into the Salt Lake City downtown area. The, the green triangle at the top right there is a, a dense deployment on a small part of uh, uh, the, uh, the campus uh, where we will be at street level and uh, we'll have uh, more dense deployment allowing us to go to, um, to higher frequencies and do things like a connected vehicle and DSRC type uh, experimentation. 
Um, so we will obviously start on campus because that's where we are and that's where things are um, uh, more easy to do. This is just uh, sort of an aerial view from Google Earth uh, of those environments. So on the, on the left-hand side, typical campus environment. On the right-hand side, actually, if you move up to uh, the, the, the medical uh, part of our campus, it looks more like an urban environment because they are uh, just building uh, buildings in pretty much every square inch that's uh, available. Um, a view of the, the radio coverage. These are uh, simulations that we've run to get a sense of uh, how good our coverage will be over that area. And, and the bottom uh, shows uh, the uh, University of Utah shuttle routes. And of course, these shuttles um, are kind of nice because they take the same route every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. And so you get uh, somewhat repeatable experimentation because they're gonna, gonna be on the same routes. Uh, same picture for the dense deployment, and actually there's the, the smallest bus route on campus will be covering uh, that, that dense deployment. So that's kind of the story in terms of physical uh, deployment, uh, if you will. So talking a little bit more about uh, the functionality, I already mentioned we're taking this end-to-end -end software defined approach, um, and we have uh, this building block approach in terms of how we build test beds, and I'll say a little bit more about that on the, on the next slide. Um, the other aspect, uh, we hope that this base functionality, software defined, end-to-end, -end, will cover a large range of research. But we also recognize that uh, people might want to deploy their own equipment uh, in the testbed. And so we have this notion of a bring your own device style research where you can essentially come and plug your own devices in at all these different layers of the architecture and we can provide uh, basic control uh, of those devices and make it available uh, through uh, our infrastructure. This is my busy slide. Um, so uh, this is trying to show this uh, building block or Lego based approach. So at the top there we have hardware components, we have software components. And as an experimenter you can come in and you can kind of take these Lego blocks and put them together in a way that makes sense for your experiment. And then the piece in the middle is we have this uh, sophisticated uh, control framework that we've been developing over many, many years that take those uh, Lego blocks once you define them and actually instantiate them on the physical uh, platform infrastructure. So another key component of uh, our approach uh, it, with regards to repeatability is a concept that we call uh, profiles. And you can think of a profile as essentially a recipe that captures everything associated with an experiment. The, the hardware needs, the software associated with that, the dependencies between that, and it's captured in a, in a very concise way. And then we can store it in a database, essentially. And then either you or someone else might come in and, and select that profile or that recipe and instantiate it again. And this is a really key component in terms of experimental repeatability. Right, so you can either take a profile that someone else has created and repeat their experiments to verify their results, or you can take a profile and kind of use that as a starting point for your own uh, experimentation. So at the bottom, it just shows, you know, once your experiment is instantiated, uh, we provide access to that remotely. So on the, on the left-hand side, it shows the, the powder portal. And then on the right-hand side, once your experiment is instantiated, you get a topology view of that, and you can gain access remotely uh, to all of these components. A little bit more detail on the uh, RF equipment. So we will have uh, essentially two categories. We will have off-the-shelf uh, RF equipment and massive MIMO. So for the off-the-shelf, we will have uh, multiple uh, antennas covering multiple bands. We will have uh, multiple software-defined radios uh, with associated compute. Uh, so sort of the bottom part of that figure uh, constitute the experimental part uh, of the uh, RF uh, subsystems. And we'll have essentially have, uh, we'll have the same uh, components, whether it's on rooftops or on uh, uh, street uh, lampposts uh, or on the buses, right? It's just the number of those components uh, will be different. Uh, we'll have fewer SDRs on the buses, for example, and of course different antennas for rooftop deployments versus uh, street level deployments. But essentially the architecture is, uh, is the same. 
Uh, so uh, Ashu will cover the, uh, the Renew, the massive MIMO, so I'm just going to skip this slide. Uh, a little bit more detail of our actual deployment. Uh, so uh, this is showing that the different colors here shows the different fiber uh, deployments that we will uh, leverage. Uh, so the, uh, basically we, with our partners, put together all these different pieces so that we have a, a private uh, fiber uh, backhaul. We'll have uh, edge compute, so the, the blue nodes there with EC edge compute, these are the uh, local nodes with a variety of, of compute uh, uh, capabilities, uh, really close to the edge, and then uh, also the, the downtown data center where we'll have our metro cloud uh, deployment. In terms of the, 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 the network, uh, it's gonna be 100 gigabits per second uh, uh, infrastructure with support for uh, synchronous Ethernet and uh, PTP uh, to allow distributed uh, antenna-based uh, operation and experimentation. Um, a little bit on the, the cloud. Uh, already said this is part of our existing infrastructure called uh, Cloud Lab, uh, which is uh, federated between Utah, Clemson, and, and Wisconsin. Uh, we'll mostly make use of the Utah uh, part of that, uh, which has uh, 300 servers and 2,500 cores. And we have the same profile uh, mechanism that I talked about before we have on this testbed already, and so there's already existing uh, profiles for things like OpenStack and, and Cord uh, available. Uh, a few words on Spectrum. Uh, in, in terms of equipment, our equipment will be capable of, of covering a broad range of, of Spectrum. Of course, Spectrum is tricky, and so we will have to make sure we abide by FCC requirements. Uh, we have uh, some, a, a program license al already, some experimental licenses. We anticipate becoming an innovation zone, uh, again, to allow uh, more uh, experimentation uh, as far as uh, frequency is concerned. Our specific interest, uh, we have, uh, we expect that our platform will be very useful for uh, dynamic spectrum access type research, and we're partnering with uh, Federated Wireless, who's, who's one of the companies uh, in that space, to provide us access to their, uh, their SaaS. I'm not going to cover this in detail, but we kind of think of the, the research that we enable in, in, in roughly four categories. There's fundamental wireless communication, uh, at, more at the end-to-end -end level, wireless and mobile networking, uh, security and privacy, and then, of course, the applications and services that are enabled or uh, place additional need on, on wireless uh, and mobile infrastructures. To wrap up, uh, we have actually a, a small technology preview available. If you go to powderwireless.net, you can uh, sign up, create an account, and kind of kick the tires. Um, and there's more information uh, on the site about our, our timeline and, and, and things like that. And then the, the pretty pictures here, uh, we're in the process of doing um, our uh, site walkthroughs and doing uh, RF measurements from all the rooftops where we will be uh, deploying. Um, so those are pretty fresh, fresh pictures. They were uh, just taken on Monday. Thank you. How's everyone doing? All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a piece, which is a Renew piece in the Powder platform, Powder testbed. And the focus of Renew piece is solely on Massive MIMO. And this morning, I think we heard a keynote from uh, Sprint's PTO. Massive MIMO is coming, and it will be with us for it, you know, all future technologies, and, but we will be working on it in many releases of 5G or beyond, at least for five to 10 years. And this is typically how technology goes. If something new is introduced, it takes us around five to 10 years to squeeze everything out of it. And it heavily relies on you know, research community to work on it. So I think the opportunity here is that we are actually deploying a test bed with the technology which is still in works with the industry. So this is, I think, the first time we are neck to neck in the abilities which academics will have than what the industry has. So I think that's an important. Um, so um, as was pointed out, uh, our role is going to be um, developing world's first programmable and observable massive MIMO network with hundreds of ability to support hundreds of antennas per base station, uh, doing it at scale, base station class equipment, and of course support diverse forms of computing models, which uh, Kobe has pointed out uh, in his part. Um, and of course we want to do it in a completely academic research mindset. So we want everything to be open source, and WARP actually taught us many lessons 
we are actually going to use the same open source, open access license, which is one of the most generous open source licenses for all our work. So I think we are hoping that this really um, brings everybody together in contributing things. Um, so again, our, as Kova said, our role is to build a tool which provides you enough power to do interesting experiments. And we would like all of you to be actually building world's first X, right? And to do that, we need to have a powerful hardware base and a completely a very powerful development platform, and then, of course, an integration into an actual testbed which you can access. <clears throat> so for, uh, for Renew, we are going to leverage uh, our experience with Rice Argos project, which was a massive MIMO array, and I'll talk a little bit about it. University of Michigan Mobile Lab, their ability to measure things, and then Texas Southern University, which has a VR lab to control physical objects from over internet. Um, so how does this whole Renew powder part, uh, collaboration looks like? Renew uh, will live inside a powder testbed, and then the architecture will be fairly straightforward here. The hardware, which include the massive MIMO components, mobile terminals, and other equipment which you heard from Covus, uh, will be part of the infrastructure. And then in your powder profile, which Covus mentioned, you will see the whole development stack and on top of that is where you will do all your experiments. So in your powder profile, we'll see pretty much every piece of software we write, will you have access to it. Um, again, uh, our, what are our driving design principles? Uh, we are, um, uh, three things which we have learned as a community, maximize the use of commodity hardware. It allows us to keep upgrading hardware as new hardware becomes available, reduces the cost. Um, and uh, relies on the fact that there is a general familiarity. Maximize use of open source software. This is really crucial. Um, we are building on open source software and making it open source too. And then adopt a, a successful open development process. So while we will, have we will uh, manage the re basic repository and development, we will be looking for the whole community to, uh, to contribute. Now the key uh, uh, workhorse for Renew is um, uh, the Argos base station, which is uh, based, uh, which is built by a Rice spin-off, Skylark, and Ryan Guerra is actually here. He's one of the co-founders. He was our former student, um, and another student, Clay Shepard, who was also our former student, they started the company Skylark. Um, and what they built is an amazing piece of hardware, which is, uh, as I say, actually spun off from a, a previous Rice project. And then the, the core element there is an IRIS software-defined radio, which is a little uh, card which has the ability to actually tune to different bands, provide as an FPGA, powerful FPGA on it, so it's onboard compute resources. And the, the key thing is that this thing, uh, the IRIS SDR can be uh, daisy-chained together to build large antenna arrays. So here I've indicated 144, but theoretically it can go up to 256 antennas. Um, it's actually base station class equipment. Uh, so in fact, you see on the bottom right a picture of a base station uh, built by Skylark deployed on Rice Stadium right next to other actual base stations from at and and Sprint. Um, uh, all the other good features we need for something like this to be available are actually part of it. Uh, it has interchangeable front ends, so in fact, you can actually take the same piece of hardware and build new front ends for it. Um, currently, uh, in addition to three and a half gigahertz band, we have gain access to 2.6 gigahertz, UHF band, and uh, you can also put your own uh, radio daughter cards on top of it. So really nicely modular design. Um, some of these frequency bands will be covered in the deployment, but the idea is that the hardware allows more so that as this thing, as we develop a new platform, other testbeds may also actually use the same hardware, deploy it in other unique fashion, and then built on our open source code base. Um, so what's our execution plan? So there are basically five key elements listed here, and they are uh, our current plan. They can change. We actually have a Powder Renew workshop later today. We are going to be spending a whole day with uh, several members of the community, researchers from the community, listening to what they do want to build. But we think these are the probably going to be on everybody's list in some form or the other. We, we, year, and they're approximately year by year, but we hope to go faster. 
Um, we will have a channel sounding framework done by end of this year, uh, then build a real-time massive MIMO open source physical layer, build on top of them a full network stack, a cellular-like network stack, and then continue building more and more uh, complicated technologies which are impossible to build for a single research group and make them available. So that's actually our driving force. Things we are doing are generally, we're, what we want to do are the most, are the hardest thing to do for any single research group. We would like them to do it to make them available to the whole community. And, and then uh, you already heard about the deployment plan. As we uh, build these things, they immediately actually pass through and get deployed on the powder platform. So not only just the hardware will be available, um, but all the software stack we build every version of it will be accessible through your powder profiles. Um, and I wanted to kind of end this um, with two research examples. Um, these are based on um, our first two versions of Argos platform. So Argos version one and version two were part, a product of, uh, again, an NSF project. And there, the Argos version one and version two were built out of warp boards. So it was much bigger, not deployable, but it allowed us to conduct experiments and ask and answer research questions which were otherwise impossible. So and I wanted to give community two examples of, from our own research. So this morning you heard talking about how FDD, Massive MIMO, is not going to happen. It's actually considered the open problem in Massive MIMO. Um, and then we actually showed uh, recently through actual measurements that in fact there is a mechanism of building an FDD scalable massive MIMO system. That means this channel estimation problem can actually be addressed in a manner which is scalable. Uh, again, this, if you want to actually write a paper on this, there is no way anybody will believe you till actually you show evidence. So this is an example of a research problem which requires concrete evidence and the platform allows you to actually generate that evidence and work with real data sets. Um, the second example here is we actually built and showed that you can do massive MIMO full duplex without adding any new analog components. So this could actually be, a full duplex could be a software stack on top of existing antennas if you're using large number of antennas. Again, it's an example of research if you want to do. Uh, you can't do it without the hardware. Nobody will actually believe you. Uh, again, this is the kind of questions which we hope even the first year outcome, which is a channel sounding framework, would help enable the community to do. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, again, uh, Kovas mentioned four words first, and what we have tried covering, and we'll be here actually for the, till tomorrow, we can all, uh, trying to dis uh, essentially address all these words first, um, while through some of our plans, but mostly listening to the community and adapting based on what community needs are. So with that, I'll stop, and we can take questions. Thank you. Um, may I request uh, the speakers, Ivan Kobus, if you might, uh, if you would like to come up, and uh, if I may ask my Power Project Office members to help farm out the mic for uh, questions as well. Um, so we'll we'll start taking questions at this point um, about the platforms in general, about the RFI RFP process, whatever thoughts you have, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, so the floor is open. We couldn't have done such a good job of explaining everything perfectly, or we've put you to sleep, so it's one of the two. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's the question of time. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself since the session's being uh, streamed as well. Uh, hi, uh, Hong Wei Zhang from Iowa State. Uh, so I guess both of you mentioned both projects have this sliceable, programmable framework, right? And I think conceptually once it's up and running, there's going to be a lot of users. So one of the questions would be how available this system is going to be, right? If we have 200 groups who want to use a two test bed, right? So my question is, uh, have you thought through like the, how many concurrent slices or maybe take each specific resource, right? How many can you support in parallel? So uh, I think the, the short answer is uh, we, we don't fully know, but um, to the extent that we will have multiple radios uh, operating potentially on different frequencies, those can operate uh, pretty much ships in the night mode, not interfere with each other. Um, the, the other aspect would be 
Um, in, 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 once we have a full deployment, you know, someone might operate in the downtown area while someone else might operate in the, on the campus area, right? So, so there is um, that sort of natural uh, flexibility that would allow you uh, to do that. Um, I think the, the, the other aspect is um, through the control framework that we have, we anticipate being able to bring things up and take them down pretty quickly so that there's a timeshare aspect as well. Now I think, again here, this is gonna depend a little bit on how people will wanna use this. You know, if you wanna run an experiment for a few hours, well that's easy, right? Someone else can use it afterwards. But if you wanna run for multiple days, then that becomes more problematic. Uh, so I think uh, it's mostly an open question, but I think there are sort of different ways in which you can uh, slice this uh, to, to get reasonable uh, shareability. And I want to say we'd be very happy to, give, to be at the stage where there are too many users, so we, that, that'd, that'd be a good problem to have. <laughs> I, I just want to add to, add to this uh, that uh, we still also have to figure out what's the policy between academic and industrial use of the testbed. So that's additional slicing that has to happen, and it's not clear how it's going to happen. But don't wait till last minute. Yes. Hi, I'm Karen Lightman, Executive Director of Metro 21 Smart Cities Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And we were one of the five finalists, but didn't make the cut. So we're looking forward to the second round. And I guess my, my question was, um, actually following on what you just talked about, the role of industry, and I mentioned and when you gave your introductory uh, slide, you were talking about the importance of working with industry. But I guess one of the things we found a little confusing was how what's off limits, what's on limits, since the list of the 28 partners that you have is quite vast, and they are some of the folks that we already have a history of working with for many years. So the question is, you know, how, how aggressive, unaggressive, what are the rules? Can you be more specific? Have you given some thought to that? I mean, maybe it's a question for you guys. But, um, you know, I, I guess I want, we, we want to have an understanding and have more explicit direction on that. Thank you. Absolutely. So, uh, great question. Thanks for bringing that up. So, um, the the guidance will actually be issued to the company consortium members. We're not going to have any explicit guidance for the teams. Uh, the teams are essentially free to approach uh, these member consortium companies. These consortiums are large enough. And even in April 2018, to be very honest with you, when we approach some members who are working in different geographical offices, they still haven't heard of participation in these uh, programs. So we don't. We, we anticipate that that's an issue that we need to handle. So what we've done is we've given guidance to our consortium members about rules of engagement. The folks who are directly involved in the consortium. So again, as I said, these are large uh, multinational companies, and there are certain offices and certain branches that are we uh, interacting with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Those people are off limits and they know they are off limits because they are contributing uh, responses about writing the RFP, they are helping us evaluate, they are helping us uh, provide some oversight. Those folks are all going to be off limit and they know that. Um, the other members of the, uh, th those companies are going to be absolutely approachable, and I don't think that we have any possible way of enforcing any such policy. So we're going to work with our small consortium and our representatives, and they will then uh, be able to provide that guidance. Joe, you want to add anything? No, I, I think that's exactly right. That's one of the things we learned is that it will be easier to control it. And now that it, one of the things in the first round was that the uh, consortium was still becoming formed as the as it was going on. And so now that it's a little more settled, we'll have a better way of uh, communicating and we'll, we'll make sure the companies know how they can engage with anybody they're approached by who's a proposer. So the companies that are already engaged with what you guys are doing are, are, are fair game. In other words, absolutely. They're still part of the broader consortium and they're still members and they, they, they are. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh, we want one Joe in the back. Yeah, I just want to get a clarification from the one of the slides you mentioned that uh, scalable uh, FGG massive MIMO is feasible. So based on that, so is that uh, the, the feasibility or possibility just through your hardware or test bed demonstration based on the existing algorithms or you believe that through more advanced design and algorithm that in the future definitely will work. So it's uh, which way? 
I've mm. put the slide up if you want to bring it up. Uh, I think so. Um, there is a, I think the Sprint CTO, John saw, right? Uh, he mentioned this morning that FDD is going to be out of bound. At least it is considered out of bound. And the, this work is a preliminary evidence, I would say, which is what academics are good at generating, you know, a clean idea and then showing an evidence for it to show that actually that is not necessarily true. The way people think of FDD massive uh, MIMO is actually, um, it can be actually scaled down the channel estimation overhead to the point that it looks almost like a TDD overhead. So I think that's the main thing, main result. Now, how do we actually take it forward? I think a lot of work to be done before we can get to a real system. But I think as an academic, we generate the preliminary evidence and an idea. And so the, the reason I s told that was that is I think everybody can get into now asking such questions and being able to answer them with these test words. I think both Cosmos and uh, both uh, Powder in you. We have time for a couple more. Uh, John Moran, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, when is the next deadline? <laughs> yes, so great question. So one is the, the first one is the RFI, which we essentially is May 31st, um, 5 p.m. universal time, I guess. But by May 31st, we'd like a two-pager maximum. Again, very informal. This is an RFI, so please don't uh, think of this as an opportunity to uh, tout your own capabilities, but essentially think of it objectively about what sort of challenges that you want to address, applications, use cases, what sort of architectures, uh, some of the trade-offs, so that sort of we uh, at the PPO working with the industry and NSF can actually then essentially put out the RFP. So there is no set deadline for the issuance of the RFP. The guidance right now is Q3 2018 um, with, again, the, the same time frame that happened in the first time with an anticipated award date of fall 2019. Hi, this is uh, Arjun Reddy from uh, IIT Hyderabad. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, both the teams and the NSF as this uh, great initiative on wireless, especially on the cellular, even though there are many such test beds and frameworks for uh, internet, and especially the Genie and other things. I see there is a missing thing, in the, especially in the cellular domain. I would like to congratulate all of you for this. So my question is uh, very basic in terms of I see that uh, you are talking about end-to-end -end software defined framework. So my question is about, are you talking about making a 4G network as a reference and you want to build on top of that? Or you are trying to look at both the 4G and 5G NR as part of this effort? So I'll, I'll start first, but I'm sure Kobus has similar. So we can easily do 4G. That's not a, I don't think it's a big deal, especially in software sense. Um, NR gets a little bit trickier, but it's also doable, and of course we are planning to do it. Problem with NR is, of course, the compatibility with the commercial devices, which are not yet available. So we, even if, if we knew what it is, we wouldn't be able to, to sort of support that at the moment. Now, hope is that, you know, the test beds are gonna evolve over time, and so will software with them, so eventually it will be there. Uh, to, to add to that, um, I, I think that's why the, the, the software end-to-end -end is, is such a, a critical component, right? I mean, like you can have the this, this same hardware and today it looks like 4G and tomorrow it looks like 5G because the functionality is defined by the software which you can more easily change than the underlying hardware. So that, that's exactly the reason for that. Perfect. We are... Um one last, okay, last question to you, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Salik, and I'm from Harvard University, Washington, D.C. Uh, my question is about virtualization in wireless domain. Uh, do you see that, or is there any possibility to come up with a virtual network that has been created by borrowing resources from different kind of wireless network, not uh, like just a cellular or Wi-Fi, but something from cellular, some from Wi-Fi, some from satellite, and, you know, consolidate to one virtual network. And do you see such possibility in your platform or in the near future? Uh, I don't see a problem as long as you can define 
virtualization in wireless domain properly, which I'm not sure I can. But uh, in other words, as long as you figure out how to manage interference, sure, why not? Um, now, as far as satellite is concerned, we do have an offer to put a satellite into the cosmos, but I don't know, I mean, what does that mean, really? So, <laughs> yes, exactly. To so, so that, that was the thing, like, because uh, we are envisioning a smart cities and we are saying that let's create slices of the network, but we have so far witnessed, like, slices within an MNO or within a radio access network. But I'm looking. I'm asking that across. Like, let's have Wi-Fi. Yeah, I don't see a problem. And let's that. consolidate yeah. and make a virtual network and give to the service provider or the request anytime. Yes, I, I don't see. I, I, there are no technical obstacles to slicing all of these elements, and, and meaning you can do it. The only question is how will the end-to-end -end system look like? And I. All right. I, thank I you. Mean, just to key off of what uh, Ivan said, I, I think uh, pieces of this in terms of virtualization is pretty well understood and you know it's pretty standard by now but but some pieces of it is still what, what, what exactly do you mean by virtualization i mean it's I, I, especially on the on the wireless side i think exactly what that means and how that would look like and how you would what what the service abstractions would be and how you would actually make use of that uh, i don't think is is that well sussed out but again in terms of the platform Yes, I think the, the idea exactly would be that these platforms would be a place where you can try to experiment with that and, and try out different things along those lines. You know, one thing I just want to point out is there's a difference between the research that you're proposing here and what these teams have sort of been tasked to do in the early on um, years is to actually develop the base infrastructure that allows those questions to be explored. Um, these teams are, you know, in addition to being researchers, they're also going to be the platform developers and operators. So they essentially give you a platform, an environment, as, you know, Kobus mentioned in his talk, these Lego blocks that you then have the opportunity as a researcher to explore these ideas on. So that's sort of a key distinction that we want to make is they're not the people who are building and doing the research themselves. They're basically building this infrastructure for people in this room. Um, so that's sort of, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, we are almost done with time. I just want to make sure we acknowledge our consortium members. I know some of them are in the crowd. Um, we, we, none of this would be possible without the support from the industry consortium. A lot of that you heard and saw today is equipment design and services that are being contributed as part of the, um, the contribution from our consortium members. Uh, we are trying our best to maximize the contribution from all of the companies, but we've, we've sort of identified a small subset that have been working really well and we've been uh, getting great feedback from both the teams as well as the consortium members. So just want to give them a last round of applause. Thank you so much.